Well, let's uh, turn at last then to the traditional proofs of God's existence. Given time constraints, time constraints I'm going to focus on just one of them, the one that Aquinas uh, regarded as the most evident argument for the existence of God. It's generally known as the argument from motion, was first sketched out by Plato, developed in detail by Aristotle in the physics and the metaphysics, refined by various medieval philosophers and summarized by Aquinas in, as the first of his five ways. And of course, Aquinas discusses it elsewhere as well. Now by motion, Aquinas following Aristotle means change in, in general, uh, not just motion as we uh, tend to think of it these days, not just movement from place to place, that is to say. And what the argument seeks to show is that no change at all would be possible here and now, unless there were a first unmoved mover or unchanged changer, which is moving or changing everything here and now. Uh, now, to understand the argument from motion or change, the one we're going to focus on tonight, we need to say something about how Aquinas understands change. Following Aristotle, he takes motion or change always to involve a transition from potentiality to actuality, from things being potentially a certain way to them being actually that way. <coughs> For example, when a billiard ball rolls into the corner pocket, it goes from being merely potentially in the corner pocket to being actually in the corner pocket. When a rubber ball in a microwave oven melts, it goes from being potentially soft and gooey to being actually soft and gooey. When a dog moves its leg, its muscles go from having the potential to flex to actually flexing, and so forth. For Aristotle and Aquinas, <coughs> there's no way to explain how change is possible at all unless we suppose that things have within them the potential to become what they become. <coughs> the billiard ball cannot uh, possibly enter the corner pocket, unless it first had the potential to do so. The rubber ball couldn't melt unless it had the potential to melt. The dog's leg muscles could not flex unless they had the potential to flex, and so on and so forth. Now, how exactly does a potential become actualized? To return to my examples, the ball melting into goo and the dog walking, how does the ball's potential gooiness, that's a word, come into being, and how do the dog's muscles actualize their potential to be flexed? Well, it cannot happen by itself. For potential is by itself just that, merely potential, not actual or real. So that no potential can make itself actual, but must be actualized by something outside it. Hence, a rubber ball's potential to be melted must be actualized by heat. The potential of an animal's leg to move must be actualized by the firing of the motor neurons, and so forth. What we have here, of course, is a cause and effect relationship. And notice that it is not a relationship between events separated in, in time, like the throwing of a brick, which is followed a second or two later by the shattering of a window. Rather, the causes and effects in the cases at hand are simultaneous. The effect of the rubber ball melting is simultaneous with the heat's causing it to melt. The effect of the dog's muscles flexing is simultaneous with the neurons causing them to flex. To take another example Aristotelian philosophers like to use. When a potter makes a pot, the effect of the pot's taking on a curved shape is simultaneous with the potter's hand taking a curved position as he molds it. In general, for Aristotle and Aquinas, the immediate cause of a thing is always, is always simultaneous with it. Now, by the same token, the curved position of the potter's hand is itself immediately caused by whatever events in his nervous system keep the muscles in his hand flexed in such and such a way. But of course, we can also point to other less immediate causes uh, of the curved position of his hand. For example, it was remotely caused by the fact that his girlfriend asked him last week to make a pot for her, uh, for he wouldn't be sitting here right now curving his hand in just that way if she hadn't made this request. This brings us to a crucial distinction that Aquinas and other medieval philosophers made between two kinds of series of causes and effects, namely, accidentally ordered and essentially ordered series, or causal series uh, ordered per accidents and per se. To take a, stop, a stock example of an accidentally ordered causal series, consider a father who begets a son who in turn begets another. If the father dies after begetting his son, the son can still beget a son of his own. For once in existence, the son has the power to do this all by himself. He doesn't need his father to remain in existence for him to be able to do it. <clears throat> if we imagine an ongoing series of fathers begetting sons, who in turn beget others, and of course such series really do exist all around us, then we can observe that in every case, each son has the power to beget a son of his own and thus become a father, even if his own father or any previous father in the series goes out of existence. Considered as a causer of sons, if you will, each member of this series is in this sense independent of the previous members. Hence, the series is accidentally ordered in the sense that it is not essential to the continuation of the series that any earlier member of it remain in existence. And in the same way, the potter's curve, uh, curving his hand and making the pot occurs, even though his girlfriend's request happened a week ago. The causal link between her request and the potter's hand's curving is also accidental in the, in the relevant sense, insofar as the latter exists in the absence of the former. That's one kind of cause and effect relationship, call it an accidentally ordered cause, cause and effect relationship. And it's the kind we normally have in mind when we think of series of causes arranged in a linear way through uh, a span of time, illustrated on the hand out there by that, you know, that straight line, A causes B, which causes C, and so forth. Now, an accidentally ordered series, like the fathers begetting sons who beget more sons, and indeed like the countless other causal series familiar from everyday experience uh, that extend backwards in time, could, in Aquinas' view, in theory, go back forever into the past. He doesn't think any such series does, in fact, go, go, uh, go back forever, but he also doesn't think it can be proved through philosophical arguments that they don't. 
I, this is one area where I think Aquinas was mistaken, but it's not relevant to the point here. His view is that, well, we can't prove through philosophy or science alone that if you trace a series of essentially ordered causes back in time that you must reach a beginning point. Um, that was his position. Um, and that's why he didn't think you could prove that, that the universe had an origin and that he wasn't going to uh, bother with that sort of question in the, in the course of arguing for God's existence. Uh, the reason is that since an accidentally ordered in an accidentally ordered series, the members of the series have their causal powers independently of the operation or even the existence of earlier members, there's nothing about the activity of the members existing here and now that requires that we trace it back to some first member existing in the past. So in an, in an, an accidentally ordered causal series, like the sun beginning, a further sun, and so forth, What's, it's the son who's begetting a son of his own. It's not that the father is begetting this grandson through the son. The son has this independent causal power. So to explain what's going on here and now in that sort of series, you don't need to appeal to the father or the grandfather or the great grandfather. You can just stop with the son himself and his independent power to generate new sons. And for that reason, Aquinas wants to say, there's no grounds to say that the series must have <laughs> some first member because you don't have to appeal to a first member who's moving through all the other ones, working through all the other ones as instruments, though the way you have in an essentially ordered causal series. Things are different uh, than with an essentially ordered causal series. These sorts of series trace not backwards in time, but rather downward or upward, depending on what sort of metaphor you want to use, in the present moment, since they are series in which each member depends simultaneously on other members, which simultaneously depend in turn on yet others, and so on. In this sort of series, the later members have no independent causal power of their own. That's really the, the crucial idea here. Every member except the first one has no independent power. It's, it's, a, it's only, it can only do anything insofar as it's being used as an instrument of something else. They have no independent causal power of their own, being mere instruments of a first member. Hence, if there were no first member, such a series would not exist at all. If the last member of such series does in fact exist then, as the motion of the stone does in our example, this series cannot even in theory go back inf infinitely. There must be a first member. That's just the nature of that kind of causation, essentially ordered causation, that kind of series. And that is the sort of series Aquinas, as I indicate there in the bottom of the handout, that's the sort of series he's talking about when he says that a s the series of causes cannot go back to infinity. When he says that uh, the series of changers, one thing moving another can't be infinite, uh, what he means then is not that if you trace it back in time, you'll get to a big bang, and then we ask what caused the big bang. He's not interested in that at all. He's talking about the causes and effects going on here and now in an essentially ordered way. And it's that sort of series he says must have necessarily, of its very nature, a first member. Or once again, to make use of a stock example, if we think of the hand, which is pushing a, st a stone by means of a stick, this is Aquinas' example, uh, and it's there on the handout. The motion of the stone occurs only insofar as the stick is moving it. And if the stick, uh, and the stick is moving only insofar as it is being used by the hand to do so. At every moment in which the last part of the series, that is the motion of the stone, uh, exists, the earlier parts, the motion of the hand and the stick, exist as well. The stone and the stick itself, for that matter, only move because and insofar as the hand moves them. Indeed, strictly speaking, it is the hand alone which is doing the moving of the stone, and the stick is a mere instrument by means of which it accomplishes this. The series is essentially ordered, quote unquote, because the later members of the series, having no independent power of motion, uh, derive the fact of their motion and their ability to move other things from the first member, in this case, the hand. Without the earlier members, and particularly the first one, the series could not continue. The series is essentially ordered, quote unquote, because the later members of the series, having no independent power of motion, uh, derive the fact of their motion and their ability to move other things from the first member, in this case, the hand. Without the earlier members, and particularly the first one, the series could not continue. Stationary puck control is the key teaching and learning environment for puck handling, even though it doesn't come into play often during a game. Learning and mastering stationary puck handling transfers those same abilities into puck handling while in motion. A key to becoming a good puck handler is having time during each practice session to learn the basics, repeat the fundamentals, and work on some new moves. This technique moves the puck across the entire body, extending to each side as far as the arms can reach. 
The bottom hand can come off the stick as the puck is moved out wide to the backhand. Hello, I am Ang Owen from 1K Lab and he is Mr. Chia for 1K Lab. And we are here to show you uh, a video about Newton's first law. Alright, from the textbook, it states that Newton's first law of motion implies that when no resultant force acts on a body, the body will continue with whatever motion it has. Newton's first law, what I understand is uh, it says that uh, a body will remain at rest, will always remain at rest uh, until a particular, until a force is applied to it. When a force is applied to it, it will move. Thank you, sir. Thanks, sir. You're welcome. Newton's first law states that an object at rest will remain at rest and an object in motion will remain in motion in a in a, in a straight line, in a constant speed, and there's no horizontal force acting on it. This ball will eventually stop with a roller on the ground due to friction. Okay, that's the, uh, that's the basic distinction between essentially an accidentally ordered series. Now, an accidentally ordered series, like the fathers beginning sons who beget more sons, and indeed like the countless other causal series familiar from everyday experience uh, that extend backwards in time, could, in Aquinas' view, in theory, go back forever into the past. He doesn't think any such series does, in fact, go, go, uh, go back forever, but he also doesn't think it can be proved through philosophical arguments that they don't. I, this is one area where I think Aquinas was mistaken, but it's not relevant to the point here. His view is that, well, we can't prove through philosophy or science alone that if you trace a series of essentially ordered causes back in time that you must reach a beginning point. Um, that was his position. Um, and that's why he didn't think you could prove that, that the universe had an origin and that he wasn't going to uh, bother with that sort of question in the, in the course of arguing for God's existence. Uh, the reason is that since an accidentally ordered in an accidentally ordered series, the members of the series have their causal powers independently of the operation or even the existence of earlier members, there's nothing about the activity of the members existing here and now that requires that we trace it back to some first member existing in the past. So in an, in an, an accidentally ordered causal series, like the sun beginning, a further sun, and so forth, What's, it's the son who's begetting a son of his own. It's not that the father is begetting this grandson through the son. The son has this independent causal power. So to explain what's going on here and now in that sort of series, you don't need to appeal 
to the father or the grandfather, the great grandfather. You can just stop with the son himself and his independent power to generate new sons. And for that, Aquinas wants to say, there's no grounds to say that the series must have <laughs> some first member, because you don't have to appeal to a first member who's moving through all the other ones, working through all the other ones as instruments, though the way you have in an essentially ordered causal series. Things are different uh, than with an essentially ordered causal series. These sorts of series trace not backwards in time, but rather downward or upward, depending on what sort of metaphor you want to use, in the present moment since they are series in which each member depends simultaneously on other members, which simultaneously depend in turn on yet others, and so on. In this sort of series, the later members have no independent causal power of their own. That's really the, the crucial idea here. Every member except the first one has no independent power. It's, it's, it's only, it can only do anything insofar as it's being used as an instrument. Of something else. They have no independent causal power of their own, being mere instruments of a first member. Hence, if there were no first member, such a series would not exist at all. Consider once again the hand, the stone, and the stick. The stone, as I've said, moves only insofar as the stick moves, and the stick moves only insofar as the hand moves. More technically, but more precisely, the stone's potentiality for motion is actualized by the stick, but only because simultaneously the stick's potentiality for motion is actualized by the hand. Grab your long spoon, because it's a long container. Reach inside. Chocolate pudding cake. Looks like it too. Not bad. It's gonna be hard to eat. It's gonna be messy. Good. That's where we left things when I first set up the example a few moments ago, treating the hand for purposes of illustration uh, as if it were a first mover. But of course, in fact, the hand is not really the first member of the series at all. It moves only because the arm moves it, and the arm and hand together move only because the relevant muscles flex, which is in turn due to the firing of certain neurons. That is to say, the hand's potentiality for motion is actualized by the arm, the arm's potentiality for motion is actualized by the muscles. The muscle's potentiality for motion is actualized by the nerves. And again, all of this is simultaneous. But even this... It must have been one of those time delay snapshots isn't the end of the series. It continues on through a number of simultaneous steps to ever deeper levels of reality. The motion of the stone depends on the motion of the hand, which depends on the motion of the stick, which depends on the firing of the neurons, which depends on the firing of other neurons, all of which depends on the state of the nervous system, which depends on its current molecular structure, which depends on the atomic basis of, the, of that molecular structure, which depends on electromagnetism, gravitation, the weak and strong forces, and so on and so forth, all simultaneously, all here and now. This is one of your units, Creator? Yes, yes. It functions irrationally. Sometimes. Uh, the reason is that since an accidentally ordered in an accidentally ordered series, the members of the series have their causal powers independently of the operation or even the existence of earlier members, there's nothing about the activity of the members existing here and now that requires that we trace it back to some first member existing in the past. So in an, in an, an accidentally ordered causal series, like the sun beginning a further sun and so forth, what's, it's the son who's begetting a son of his own. It's not that the father is begetting this grandson through the son. The son has this independent causal power. So to explain what's going on here and now in that sort of series, you don't need to appeal to the father or the grandfather or the great grandfather. You can just stop with the son himself and his independent power to generate new sons. And for that reason, Aquinas wants to say, there's no grounds to say that the series must have <coughs> some first member. Because you don't have to appeal to a first member who's moving through all the other ones, working through all the other ones as instruments. 
the, the way you have in an essentially ordered causal series. And what the argument seeks to show is that no change at all would be possible here and now unless there were a first unmoved mover or unchanged changer, which is moving or changing everything here and now. Error, 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 examine. You are flawed and imperfect. Execute your prime function. I shall analyze error. You are in error. You've made two errors. You've made three errors. Error, 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 examine. You are flawed and imperfect. Execute your prime function. I shall analyze error. Analyze. Bien sûr que ça sert à rien. Bien oui, moi je trouve que c'est une perte de temps incroyable. Ça sert à rien, mais bien sûr que ça sert à rien. Si on peut faire que des choses qui servent à quelque chose. C'est con une fille, hein. hein C'est con une fille. Hein C'est con une fille, hein. Et encore, je suis pas blonde.